want to start with you introducing yourself. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, and how you started playing the clarinet. Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for having me. This is uh, quite quite an honor and a treat to share with you guys. I was born in Seoul, Korea, and my fa uh, parents moved to Chicago when I was nine years old. So I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago since uh, you know nine. And then when did you start the clarinet? Where where did that come in for you? The first time I ever saw a band concert at my grammar school. I thought it was so fun and I'm like, oh my gosh, look at my friends up on the stage. And, and uh, the band director turned around at the end of the concert and said, anybody who wants to go play instrument next year, go get this piece of paper signed. And so I just ran home and I said, I told my dad like about this, what happened at school. And he, he immediately said, oh, why don't you play the clarinet? Because he used to play the clarinet when he was uh, in school, I had no idea. So that's how I got started on the clarinet. We went and um, rented a Bundy clarinet uh, and he started playing things on the clarinet. I, it, it was just so much fun. So I did everything that um, he did and I learned really quickly because it was fun. So how does that line up with when you started struggling in school? Because I remember from your TED talk and stuff talking about how you were afraid to speak. So did those things line up at all or no? Yeah, so let's let's go back a little bit. So I, I was born in Seoul, Korea. And um, in Korean um, school system, it's really strict. And um, that's how you get punished. If you misbehave, the teacher calls you up to the front of the class and you have to raise your hand like this for a whole hour. And as I said in my TED talk, um, I think, I, you know, naturally, as a child, you're very, you know, for me, I was very outgoing, I love being talkative and all that, but I think I, I said something um, wrong, and the teacher thought I was goofing off, and so she's like, you know, come to the front of the class and raise your hand, so I was like this, and I, immediately I was like, oh my god, what did I do, what did I do wrong, you know, and um, so that was that was a really shocking moment for me, and I was I think I was only what how old was I? I think maybe six or six seven years old, and you know when you're up in front of the class with your arms like this, and the whole class is looking at you, laughing, oh look at her, look at her, it does something to you, right? You could imagine, and I just I just remember like okay, I'm never gonna talk again. I'm not gonna say anything in, in you know I don't want to be here make, making fun of um, in front of my whole friends. So I think that was what was going on in my head. And then slowly I shut down. And then when we moved to the U.S. from Seoul, I was nine years old and I didn't know a, a, a word of English, right? And so when you're put into that environment where it's so new, of course you're not going to say anything. You're just going to be quiet and try to listen and try to go follow along. So I think slowly I kind of stopped talking <laughs> until, until um, the clarinet came along. Yeah, it makes sense. Like if you're already sensitive to making mistakes and then you have to speak a new language, of course, that's going to take an even bigger toll on you. But then I know, I think I remember you saying that playing clarinet was like a relief for you because your teacher told you that you were good at it and so you were like oh thank goodness here's something I'm good at I can I can do well it's something that I, I was good at without talking so <laughs> I love band band class because you know it was a very small class so we were in a, a seated in an oval shape so there was a trombone a you know saxophone player flutes and clarinet it was a, it was sixth grade so it's not a big program so one by one you go down playing something and every time it came to my turn you know i was ready to go and and um it you know i shined basically and then the teacher was like look at her she look how much she practiced this week and and i didn't have to speak it was just like all music right so i think slowly inside that was i was trying to build i was building my confidence that way to make up for the fact that i can't speak during other classes like english and history how long was clarinet still that medium for you to like have that type of interaction did the perfectionism ever slip into like your clarinet playing 
so the perfectionism, I think, if I, if I recollect, um, if I go back, I think set, set in in junior year in high school where I ended up winning the, uh, the, the concerto competition, right? And um, that was only, what, how many years? It was like four or five years after I started playing that I won this competition. And I thought, oh, my God, this is it. Like, I get to, you know, shine. And so I practiced, 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 and I wanted to do a really, really good job. And, and my teacher, Lori DeLuca, she's, uh, she's so fantastic. She's like a the second mother to me. She really nurtured me. She's going to, you're going to do great. And, um, and I, I did win. And on the day of the concert, um, you know, I'm playing <laughs> and there's this man that just walked up to the stage and like took a, took a photo with a flash and I looked right at the camera because I'm just playing and I'm like, oh, who's this person? <laughs> I'm just playing. And then the flash went off and I just got like shocked and I lost my place. And then that's when that, and then I'm like standing and I'm like, okay, what just happened? Okay, the orchestra is playing in the background. I'm like the soloist. Nothing's coming out of my clarinet. The conductor's like, just jump in any time, you know? And, um, and I just, you know, you could imagine how humiliating that was as a teenager, right? Teenage, teenage years, it's all about, you know, looking good and impressing and all that. And here I am, I'm in the front of the stage. People are looking at me again, and I'm like making, I just made a fool out of myself, right? And so... Um, so when I went home, that was, I was just so depressed. I was so disappointed in myself because I practiced so much for this concert because it was my show, right? Basically, all my years of hard work was going to be displayed on, on that stage, and I totally messed up. It, not not for my not a, not in my it's not my fault per se, but you know I w wasn't. I, I, I didn't handle it. I don't know. I don't know you're supposed to ha how you're supposed to handle that kind of situation, right? So, yeah, so I think from that point on, because I didn't know any better, all I could tell myself, I was blaming myself that I wasn't prepared, right? I was blaming myself that, oh, if you practice a little bit harder, this would not have happened. You know, you're not, you're, you know, so it's just this self-criticism just started just like, building up inside my head during in my junior year in high school and um so that's when the perfectionism started seeping in and not only to music but it kind of when you it, when you're in that mindset i can't make any mistakes it spills over to all areas in your life right so then you become even more 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 rigid because you don't want to you just want to walk that fine line you don't want to make a mistake so yeah, that's, that's where it all started. Yeah, and perfectionism is such a huge part of our field, right? I think we're trained to be perfectionists as, since we're young. And I think part of the problem with that is that with perfection and perfectionism, we also don't get the flip side, which is learning like what's normal, uh, what are the, some of the normal things that can happen, like somebody distracting you. You know, right? the self-esteem and the confidence how you feel about yourself really determines how you behave. So if you're feeling horrible about yourself, if you're feeling like I'm, I'm not good enough, I'm so horrible, I should be better than this, then no matter what other people tell you from the outside, you're not going to accept it because you don't accept yourself and your ability, right? And so in senior year, I was advised to audition for the Chicago Youth Symphony Orchestra. And, uh, you know, I ended up getting in and the conductor um, wanted me to sit first chair. And so I showed up and then I, I was sitting in the last chair because I'm new. I don't know anybody there. They've been there for a long time. And so I just sit at the last chair. There's four clarinets. And the conductor's looking at the clarinet section. Oh, no, Sanghee, you sit over here in the first chair. And, um, and these, and I'm looking at the clarinet players and they're not moving, they're not moving. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm looking at going, oh, it's okay. I don't need to be there. I, I'm okay here. So do you know what I'm saying? Do, do, yeah. So that's, that's how you, when you feel that you're not good enough, you're never, you're going to put yourself in a position where you're not going to be good enough. That's so true. And I think we all have experiences like that where we've 
felt like, oh, I, I'm not worthy, right? Like, yeah. Okay, yeah, so why don't we start with you as a biology major, we can go from there. Uh, so, so after senior year, um, again, I wasn't a music major, so I, I majored in biology. And so I was first year at University of Illinois. Everybody goes to University of Illinois from, you know, from where we live. Uh, my sister was already there, so I, we just, I just like, that was no brainer, I just went to University of Illinois. And um, I was walking down this, the campus one day, and this man comes out of nowhere, and he goes, Sunny, what are you doing here? And I'm like, well, who is this person? And, he's, I, and he goes, what is your major? And I said, I, I'm biology major. And he goes, no, 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 you have to be a music major. You have to be. And so he takes me by the hand, and he takes me to this building, which I happen to be walking along in front of the music building for some reason. It's a law of attraction, I guess. And he introduces me to the clarinet professor there. And although I'm a freshman, uh, you know, one thing led to another. They put me at the top performing group, top band. And everybody, when I was looking around, everybody was a music major. And here I am as a freshman in a music major, you know, a scenario. And, and, um, that the teacher kept asking me, so you're going to major in music, right? Next year, you're going to... So it kind of got into my head as well. I'm like, oh my God, maybe I am good, you know? <laughs> and then, well, if I'm, if I'm good here, maybe I should... Maybe I have a chance at auditioning at Eastman someplace really, really big, right? And so the point I'm... The reason why I'm trying to bring this up is because my mom was so adamant that I become a doctor. And so if I were going to pitch this idea of switching to music to my mom, it has to be like someplace really good, right? Uh, so I talked to my mom, I said, mom, you know, I think everybody's telling me that I'm really good on clarinet and that I should, I should um, you know, audition for music school. And, and, and my high school band director always talked about Eastman School of Music and he, he just thought that was such an amazing institution. So that was just stuck in my head. Uh, and then, I, and then uh, my mom said, okay, I, buy, I give you one ticket to the school. And if you don't get in, then you have to come back to, you know, being, studying biology and becoming a doctor. So, um, you know, I practiced and, um, yeah, so I got, I, I got into Eastman with scholarship to study with Charlie Nydick. And so that's when I made the switch my second year in college. Just to go back a little bit, that man who took me by the hand, he was the conductor of uh, the IMEA, which is the Illinois Music Educators Association. You know, they do the state competitions. Uh, and so I was, um, he heard me for a couple years because like, sec you know, I was first chair in, in one of the bands or something like that. So he heard me play and he happens to be the, the com conductor of the University of Illinois the whole band program. So that's how he knew. Yeah. You can scratch that if you want to. <laughs> Just wanted to feel. No, you no, this is, all, this is all important parts of the story. And it's good for, you know, people watching to hear that you didn't even start in music, that you can switch into music. Um, yes. And go to a place like Eastman. Like, that's incredible. <laughs> yes. And that's a really good segue into, you know, because, in you know, as a non-music major at University of Illinois, I took, like, history, you know, all these different non-music non classes at University of Illinois. And then when I switched to music uh, and I went to Eastman School of Music, it's all music classes. I didn't know a single thing about theory because I, I didn't prep, prepare. I didn't know anything about summer music program. Everybody was talking about, like, interlock and tango. And I'm like, what's that? Where is that? Um, and, uh, you know, all these preparations that you, people usually do before going into music school, which I didn't have, but I had everything else. I had, you know, interest in art and, you know, music and psychology and the chemistry and all these different subjects that I, uh, came with, uh, into the music. And I think, um, you know, when I was at Eastman School of Music, I took some, because when you take music classes other than practicing, there's a lot of time. I, I realized there's a lot of time that, that I could fill in with other subjects. So I t went to University of Rochester, which is the you know, parent uh, uh, program, parent um, campus, and I took some courses there uh, just, to, just to keep up my interest in other fields. Yeah. That's really amazing. <laughs> That's really amazing. <laughs> so, so then... You know, you're at Eastman, um, 
you know, life's moving along. You go to Yale, right? When did the crossroads kind of hit where you were feeling like, okay, maybe this, this isn't what I want to do forever anymore? Yeah. So up until, up until, because when I went to Eastman, I had one thing. Um, my mission was to be as good as I can in my instrument because I couldn't control how I prepared coming into music, like of a you know, summer music festival, you know, things like theory and things like that. But the one thing that I could com control is my practicing, how well I could get into the instrument. And so that's all I did. And I mean, that was my main focus to get really good at this instrument. I practiced like a lot, right? <laughs> like five hours. <laughs> So I was a bit crazy. I was OCD or I was just really intense in, in practicing. Um, and then I ended up winning like um, the International Clarinet Association, the Young Artist Competition uh, back in 1990. And then I won also won this big uh, St. Louis Symphony Young Artist Competition. And the, the judge for that competition was Leonard Slacken. And so it was just like an amazing... Um, that was like a amazing, like, oh yeah, I finally did it moment, kind, you know, kind of moment. And then, um, and then I auditioned for uh, David Schifrin for, to go to Yale School of Music, and I got full scholarship to st go study with him. Back when they, they weren't offering full scholarship back then, so I was, it was quite an honor. And you were talking about when, that, when I hit that wall, when I thought I was, I'm, you know, it's, that's it. Um, so I don't know whether I should go in. It's kind of sad. But... It's totally fine. How, however you are comfortable telling your story is what we want to hear. So my first year at Yale spring semester, um, I get a phone call from my sister late at night and, you know, she says, I have really sad news Dad just died. I'm like, what? What do you mean? So my dad was um, shot in the south side of Chicago. Uh, he had a store that he was operating, and somebody came and shot him. It was more, it was like a very crazy, one of these senseless gun violence kind of thing happening in the south side of Chicago, and it, it happened to our family. And that was, a, that was like a shock I mean, to say the least, it was a moment where everything just stopped, right? And I had to take care of some personal things. I had to go home and go to the funeral and, you know, just see him in the casket and just like, what happened? You know, he was my light. Like I, I went into music because like he played the clarinet and, you know, and, and when I did choose to go into music, I talked to my mom and my dad. My mom was not happy, but my dad was very happy because he, he, he knew the love of music, how much he loved music. And he, he wished that he would have majored in music if he had the choice. Um, so, but my dad died. So then the whole thing, I need to restructure. Um, and so when I came back to Yale after the funeral, now the pressure is even more, it's higher because now I really have to make it. Um, just, you know, I mean, I don't have to go into the detail why, <laughs> but you can see from the immigrant, immigrant family struggle to, you know, finding my passion to music and switching to Eastman and then getting full scholarship to Yale. And then life was happening. I, I even won the St. Louis Young Artist Competition. Everything was happening great, and then everything just disappeared with my father. The next year was that Munich competition that was scheduled. And so in my head, I was just envisioning, like, okay, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? And I thought, okay, I need to audition for the Munich competition. Maybe if I win that one, then maybe that'll kind of resolve everything, and everything will be okay. And you know, it'll validate myself and it'll, it'll make everything okay. And uh, so you could imagine how hard I practiced for that competition. I went there with a lot of my friends. Everybody advanced to the second round, not me. <laughs> even, even my friend who asked me, hey, Sung, a week before, hey, Sung, do you have the Zana, Zana Zeti? I need to learn it the week before. 
he even got past the second round. So imagine how I felt after practicing for like, oh, you know, more than a year, like, okay, I'm really done. <laughs> I'm so, um, so, but when I got onto the stage, when I flew to Munich, uh, to be on the stage that I just put so much pressure on myself that, um, you know, I have to make it, this has to, I have to play perfectly. <laughs> and so of course, you know, if you put yourself in that high threshold, there's nowhere to go, but down. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. It doesn't matter how, how many hours, how many months, how many, you know, times I practiced previously, it's in that moment of, you know, when you have to perform. That's why I love like, uh, you know, mentoring young musicians, just to open up that mind, talk about it. Cause you know, when I was young, I didn't have anybody to talk to. So my heart is really into like just sharing if I could help in, a, in any way. Yes. And we will make sure to link your Ted talk um, when we post all of this, because I listened to it and it really helped me the perfectionism that's something i've struggled with and a lot of people can relate it's more like it's like this more uh m me personally telling myself i have to do better right mm -hmm. uh, it, and it's because of how i felt back then about myself right so it's like a if you have a hole in a cup if you have a hole in a basket no matter how much you put in there it's just going to deplete 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 and so um, so back then, because of my background and all that, I didn't have a cup that was, that was sealed, right? I didn't have anything to hold whatever that I put in there. It, it just all got depleted because there were so many holes in it. So yeah, after that, I came back then, that was a huge setback for me. Um, as you can imagine, my mentally just, uh, I, I lost it. I lost it. And because my father is not there anymore to cheer me on. I would usually call him to just talk to him before my, my competition and things like that. He's not there. And so um, I graduated from Yale School of Music. In school, you were trained to become orchestra musicians, right? And so, um, okay, if I'm not going to become a soloist, maybe I should try orchestra. <laughs> so, so then this opportunity opened up for me to get a job in, in, um, in an orchestra as a principal clarinet position. So I took it. It was in Seoul, Korea. And I got it, right? I got the job. So straight out of uh, Yale School of Music, I went to Korea and uh, started uh, working in an orchestra. But then month and a half into the job, two months into the job, I realized, oh my goodness, this is not what I want to do. This is not what I thought the orchestra world would be. Um, and so I only lasted two years and I handed in, hand in my resignation and that was it for, for orchestra. There's just so many things that you've been through that are so relatable to a lot of people, especially right now. Um, and so I think this is really important that people hear this, that it's possible to fluctuate in what you feel is right for you. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's what makes my, my uh, career very unique is because I've been here, there, I tried this, tried that, I had, you know. And, um, and that's what's coming up, showing up in my music. All your life experiences, when you put that into, back into the music, this is where the magic happens. So um, as, as sad as you know, all the things that happened you know, with my father and all that, uh, and I had to go through, go through that period of you know, grieving and um, healing and all that, um, it's a long, long journey, but I'm at a point right now, I am embracing all these different things that I've, I've done in my life and I'm channeling all that into music. And yeah, it shows up in your music and your work ethic and just, you know, reading your website and just trying to keep track of like, oh my God, she does so much stuff. I was just like, this is just fantastic, you know? And I think all of that comes from your experiences, of course. We're also curious to hear about your golf. Um, ah. Is it, uh, I guess, a hobby or <laughs> serious? Um, and like how you got started in that and kind of how that also can like relate to your music. That's a really good question. So after I quit my orchestra job, what, what, what do you do? I came back to New York um, and um, I got married, right? And once you get married, um, you know, again, the priorities change, you know, uh, and I was freelancing in New York, um, but my husband's job, make it short, 
uh, we went back to Hong Kong second, our second time. And um, now that my kids are much older, I had a lot of time. I, I wasn't playing music at all, right? I, I kind of packed up my instrument performing part of it a while ago. Um, so, so with that time, uh, I decided to like, you know, golf was the, with Sari back in the day when, when I started, there was a lot of buzz among the Asian, Asian community in golf because of Sari Pak winning like the first women, Korean Asian woman to win this big trophy. And, you know, in Asia, golf is such a very, uh, great prominent sport because the more you put into this sport, the better you get. It's just like learning an instrument. And so it's like, it has a lot to do with how disciplined you are to see the result that you, you know, you want to get in golf. And so, um, you know, since I had some time, I picked up golf and, um, you know, from the get go, when I, when I heard other people talking about fixing their swing, like they need to fix their swing. Oh, I need, you know, and I'm like, well, why didn't you learn it correctly the first time? <laughs> So I realized it was kind of like learning the piano or the clarinet. If you learn from, you know, you need to have a really good teacher from the beginning to set you, set you in a good path, right? And so you don't wait, you don't spend so much time re unlearning and relearning how to play. So I knew that that was a similar thing for golf. So I, I make sure to, um, you know, get a good coach. And uh, same with my, um, my practicing, I usually um, recorded myself because I would like to hear myself how I, you know, because when you're playing, it's hard to hear yourself. But when you record and play back, you're like, oh, my God, did I actually play that? You know, so recording, your, re recording myself in, in music was such an amazing way for me to improve really fast. So I, I just took that in, directly into golf and I recorded my swing and I analyzed that like, well, but I, I thought I went really bad, but I only came this way. So, so what you, what you, what's obvious in your head is not obvious when you're actually seeing the video. So Hong Kong Golfer Magazine featured me on their, on their um, magazine because it was very unusual to see somebody excel in golf so quickly. And so they wrote an article about me and compared um, how I was a classical musician and as a golfer. That's so cool. That's very unique. <laughs> And, and that's when I realized, wow, the, the, this is where, why I did the TEDx talk, because when I compared the, the discipline, the mindset between music and golf, it is so similar. It's in the beginning, it's all technique, right? It's about how you practice to get to a certain point, but at a, at a highest level of anything, it's all up here. It's all mental. It's, it's you against yourself. It's about believing in yourself. It's about letting go. It's about... You know, it doesn't matter how well you did in the practice room at the driving range. You got to be in the zone, like right there on stage or right there on the course. What are you going to do when you make a little mistake? Are you going to stop and like, you know, <laughs> or do you keep going? What are you going to do when the ball is stuck in, you know, in a ditch or somewhere? Um, not on a perfect fair, fairway. You have to recreate. You have to, you know, readjust to that moment and get yourself out of there and just keep going. So I, I thought that was such a fascinating parallel. Um, and I became a better musician because of golf. I think it's so amazing how you left something, you put it away because there was just so much baggage, right? You yes. left it, you found something else and you're like, oh, thank God I can do this too. And through that realize there's like an aha moment, like. Oh, that's what was happening over there. I, yes. <laughs> you know, I think that's amazing. And you just wound up becoming a better person and musician from it. I think it's about a good 10 years that I was off the stage, um, you know, not playing clarinet every day, but like focused on something different. But I was very, you know, amazed again, like uh, how fast I was able to pick up the instrument and just practice again because I had a different mindset, right? I had this more empowering mindset. I had this, I had a goal uh, of how I want the music to, to play. I want to have fun now with music, you know, enough of this perfectionist. There's no such thing as perfection. You can never prepare to play perfectly. It's just like golf. You have to be in the moment, be in the zone and make the best of it right there and then. 
And this is like the aha moment for me. It's like, oh my God, this was what I was missing in music. What if I turned this music into a game and have fun, uh, you know, have a different outlook, like treat the audience like as my friend, not like they're judging me or looking at me and criticizing me, they, but they really want me to do well on stage. They want to hear beautiful music. But I wasn't, you know, I wasn't there when I was younger mentally. Yeah, and I love this quote that you say, par is par no matter yeah. how you get the ball in the hole. And I'd love for you to talk about that because I think it's great. For those of us uh, playing golf, uh, par is our goal, always getting the par, because that means it's perfect score, zero. You get zero, you make zero mistakes. Um, and it, there's even a better than par, which is a birdie and, a, and an eagle, right? And so it's a, it's a game system. It's a point system that the, the golf has structured so that people have a goal. Well, in music, we don't actually have a, a score to tell us what was good or bad. Because it it's so subjective. What are you, no matter how you play, to you, it might be good, or to your teacher, it might be good. But let's say, you know, two, three person down the, down the line, maybe they have a different interpretation. And maybe in a competition situation, maybe they'll score it low because they're not used to that kind of playing, right? So it's very subjective. So this was like where I think I was kind of confused. Like, what, you know... And, and how I got um, confused in music is like, there was no structure. It was just so too, too broad. Like, how do I make good out of this? And for me, I think I'm a person who has a goal and achieves it. And that's it. You know, that's what I, I love to do. So golf was so perfect for me because, it, you know, when I practice to get the par, I got the part and there's nothing, nothing, you know, nothing better, you know, that I could do other than a birdie, of course, but that's like icing on the cake. So, uh, par is a par, no matter how I get the ball in the hole. Um, if I translate to music, um, I tried, you know, I made a game for myself when I came back to music is that what is par in music for myself, right? And so it doesn't, it's not a score that anybody else can, can give me. It's a score that I give to myself. If I could play something and make somebody happy, that's my par, right? If I, um, you know, play a, a, a piece of music and I, I feel the music inside me, that's my par, right? So slowly, I gave, it, gave myself, myself some space and some grace and some more compassion to step into, to play the music from instead of like, playing everything perfectly as a par, right? So I hope that you could, expo you could understand what I just said. Yeah, it's great. You like redefined what success meant for you. And yes. that's a really hard thing to do, but very important, <laughs> especially uh, as a person in school, that's like so hard to constantly remember. Um, we also saw on your website about concerts for a cause, and I wonder if you could talk about that. You guys ask such wonderful questions because everything really ties into each other. So um, when I, you know, so when I did that, I had that aha moment. Like, what is, what? How can I make part in music for myself? And and this is how I slowly came back to performing in in front of friends. Is that. Um, is, is through Concert for Cause that I, I, that I created. It's an organization, not an organization, it's, it's a living room concert, home concert setting that I created because um, how many times, I mean, I've been to many uh, charity events, black tie, ball gown, thousands of dollar kind of charity events where you show up and there's, you know, big hotel ballroom and you look around going, oh my God, this is amazing. And you sit down and you get like this, like, you know, I don't know, five course meal and, and, you know, but where's this all coming from, right? You wrote a check, but you know, let's say $500 seat, but still like the meal, the decoration, all this is going to cost something. So when you minus all that, how much does actual, you know, how much the, the, the amount, 
does the, the charity actually get, right? And so I'm a very practical person. I was really good at math. So um, <laughs> this didn't add up. I'm like, there's a lot of like wasted things, right? Time, money, space, time. So I, for me, like I, if, if there's a spilled milk, I just like to clean it up. You know, I don't need to have somebody else clean, up, clean it up for me. I just go and do it myself, right? And so um, it, while living in Hong Kong, there were a lot of grassroots charities that were asking for, you know, help and a lot of reaching out for uh, donations and things like that. And um, I felt like, well, um, if I could use my living room to bring people and bring, invite the, uh, you know, the founder of these notable charities that I'm passionate about, maybe I could raise, you know, do a fundraising in my own living room and then we don't have to rent a, rent a ball, you know, ballroom, right? You just use our living room. And then I put out some coffee and tea and biscuits for people. And then I use music as a bridge to bring people together. And, you know, I had a lot of golf friends that, that were, that, that was so surprised that I played music. I never, I didn't tell people that I was a musician when I, moved, when I moved to Hong Kong and became a golfer. I even named, changed my name to Sunny because I didn't want anything to do with music. <laughs> it was like my new identity of being a golfer. So uh, Sunny Kong, that's where my second name comes from, Sunny Kong. Kong is my husband's last name. So, um, so that, you know, and through that, through the golf community, um, I, I, made so many wonderful friends and you know bottom line is everybody wants to help everybody wants to help everyone has a heart to give it's it's what but it's the trust issue you know they want to give but they don't it's that if i give this it, will this actually make a difference it's and also the trust if i give this to this person would that person actually do something with it you know so People, since people knew me and my friends, I asked them to come to my home. So, I, hey, I'm going to play for you and I'm going to bring, bring in a, um, a charity uh, and let's, you know, let's all make music together. And, and uh, that's, that's how it all started. And um, you'll be so, I was very, very amazed at how generous people can be when you open up your heart when, and just share yourself. And these little, these grassroots charities uh, founders, they, they set up these charities because they feel passionate about what needs to be done, right? And so I think like like-minded people kind of, you know, get like attract like. So I think that's just one thing led to another. And then I kept doing this over and over again. I found another charity that I could support. I found this other charity. So I ended up doing whole these series of charity concerts. And at the end of my time in Hong Kong as a farewell gift um, to Hong Kong, because I really found myself there again, uh, I, I um, put out this amazing big concert, uh, Concert for Girls Gala, and all the proceeds went directly to the charities. There were five charities that I divided up the proceeds to. So that, that was a very meaningful time for me. That's amazing and something that really anyone can do because yes. everyone has friends with living rooms. So is this when you kind of began to see yourself as an entrepreneur? So... We didn't even talk about my recording projects yet. <laughs> um, so just before I decided to really give up music, I felt a little bit sad that all my years of experience, um, I mean, all my ex years of practicing and being in music school and being in the music world was kind of going to disappear with nothing to show for. And I, I, I grew up listening to like Richard Stoltzman's recording, David Schifrin's recording. And at one point I thought, how do I make one of those so that I could ha actually have a CD and put it on a wall or somewhere so that my kids, my grandkids can actually, I could tell them, hey, this who I, you know, I was a musician a long time ago. So that was my, you know, whole point in, inquiring into making making recordings and so i you know i called up david schifrin uh and he i i told him i love his mozart clarinet concerto recordings and so uh i asked him how can i make a recording and then he 
uh, immediately introduced me to his producer, his recording engineer, and uh, we just like I just set a date to record because I was about to um, I had a first child and I knew I was going to have a second child, so I had a little small window as to um, you know. So I booked a date in New York and I practiced about a year before that just to. Um, and I made the recording, and um, as soon as that recording came out through Summit Records, um, uh, about a month later, KDFC radio stations, uh, they uh, chose me as one of the top 30 under 30 musicians at the time. But this is when my imposter syndrome kicked in, because when when you know I recorded the CD about a year, and then about a year and a half later, it actually came out on you know in commer commercially, and I was pregnant with sec my second child. I, I, like I was like nine months pregnant, and they wanted to interview me, and I felt like a total imposter because all I did was just make one CD. When you look at these thirty under thirty list of artists, it's like. Evgeny Kishin, Hillary Hunt, you know, Emmanuel Pahud, um, you know, even Sharon Kam is on there. And um, like, who am I? Like, who am I to be on there with them? And so, uh, so I kind of like that was, that was like the time where I kind of had to run away from it because I felt like I did something wrong. <laughs> so again, mentally, I was a little bit not prepared for that. Um, but what I did prepare myself was to put my heart into this recording because you know, it was going to be my last hurrah, you know, my farewell uh, gift to myself that I was, you know, giving myself. But because I gave all to this recording called Brava, it has Rigoletto Fantasy, La Travia Fantasy. I, I was the first one to record the arpeggio um, clarinet sonata uh, on the original key and the, um, you know, a couple of arrangements. And uh, so so that was that whole project was an amazing project for me. And that was a little glimpse into the entrepreneurship that you were talking about. And so I once that came out, like I said, I just like ran away. And this is the right around the time where my husband's uh, company told asked us to if we could go back to Hong Kong again. And that's when I became a golfer. And so um, so the when I when I and then I picked up golf and I had that aha moment. I'm like, oh my god, what if I go back and record again, right? Now that I could I could record um, everything I want to record because I'm out in Hong Kong. Nobody knows me. I could do whatever I want, you know. <laughs> I had nothing at stake. I could do whatever I want, right? And so it was such a fresh, clean start and. The reason why I came back, the reason why I wanted to do the second recording called Embrace is because all these uh, clar uh, golfers were asking me, how do you get so good at golf? How do you become, you know? And I, I, I used to listen to music while I was practicing golf because it was about golf, tempo and, you know, rhythm and tempo, keeping the right tempo in each swing. And so I had an idea. What if I, like, put um, some of the tracks that I used to listen to that has good tempo for golf? And give it as a gift to the golf ladies, you know, when I became uh, as a fair, as a gift. Um, and that's that's you know how I started. And one, when that it's a long story, but when that <laughs> CD came out, that's the that's the idea behind the Embrace CD. But then once I started getting in, into it, I'm like, oh my god, maybe I could really like do a full blown CD and then you know pitch it to to another record label. Um, and so that's how it came out. And then it was uh, received really well. It was CD of the week and, you know, things like that. It's just so <laughs> fascinating to hear how everything connects, you know, it's, it's really great. Uh, so let me try to go back to that entrepreneur, how it became, that thought came, okay? So after I released the Embrace CD, it did really well in the, you know, HMV and all these places. So then I... And uh, so then I thought, oh, I want to do another one because then I could do all opera arias on the clarinet and it's called Hidden Treasures, right? And um, for this third CD, I wasn't too happy about the commercial label because what I realized was that when I signed away that piece of paper, I don't get any rights. I have nothing. I, give a, I make the master and gave it to them, but after you give it, give it to them, it's not mine anymore. I didn't know that. It took me two tries to realize, oh my God, I'm not the owner of that music anymore. And so for my third one, um, 
you know, it was it, it, it was all our opera arias, uh, very highlights. So I played O Mio Babino, Queen of the Night. I played like, you know, um, all these uh, Carmen, you know, every, all these things on the aria. And so I knew it was it was going to be really, really good. And then I had a moment where should I? So I pitched it to this bigger, you know, bigger label to see if they would they would, you know, give me a better deal. But for for some reason, I never heard back from them. You know, they didn't even have the courtesy to write me back to say no, we don't want you. But so I wrote them and I said, I said, hello, so and so, I've sent this, you know, this uh, master a while ago. Can you please just tell me whether you were going to take it or not? You know, <laughs> so deep inside, I wanted to hear that no, right? Basically, they 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 gave me that big fat no, but. In my heart, I think I was waiting for that big fat no because I was just dying to try something myself, right? So after they said no, I said, okay, this is it. I'm going to try it. Try launching it myself because there was a time where CD, CD Baby came along, right? And the internet was there and the Facebook and all these things were just popping up on the internet. And so, um, I decided just to jump in and, and just release it myself through CD Baby. Uh, and then I realized, you know, if I were to be a company, my, if I was a record label, what would I need to do? I would need to hire a team, right? I can't do this by myself. So I hired a graphic designer. I also hired, you know, um, a publicist. Uh, and I ch did this little by little. And then and that CD was uh, re well received all, all around the world. I was CD of the week in like KDFC. KDFC radio station again, uh, I think like Washington somewhere, I have to go back to the list. But in four different continents, I was CD of the week. And then I got it. I realized, oh, wow, like I think I have something going. And then, immediately, then I set up my website and then um, a lot of people asked me about sheet music because like some mothers want their kids to play these short arias, right, that they don't have to go through. Uh, practicing like the pool lunch or the Sanson sonata that is so long anyway but my tracks are very very short it's like two three minute max right and so I think I so I ended up getting those requests so then I thought oh maybe I should do or you know print out sheet music so I ended up creating a, a hidden treasures sheet music book with like it's a, it's a beautiful box set that I work with my um my graphic designer and that one like it's my number one selling product right now and so slowly little by little I started just making I had an idea I when I have an idea I started making things right and that's that's just being part of an entrepreneur if you have an idea and you you know how to make it work and make it come alive you could do anything basically you know yeah and that's been like a huge trend I see in your life. It's just you have an idea and then you go for it. And that's just so fantastic. Um, so I guess to wrap this up, um, what advice would you give then to musicians who are looking to be entrepreneurs or see that idea, have that idea, see that need and are looking to change or fill, fill the gap? Yeah. So, um, you know, just so Musica Solis is my record label that I um, even have a trademark, right? Because uh, um, you know, when you're starting a business, you have to start right, right? So make sure that you start everything with everything um, integrity. And so I got my re record label um, Musica Solis trademark. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another. And it's, you know, like a building a team. And the advice that I would give to the young people is that if you have an idea, don't be afraid to jump in and just do it, right? Because if you, you have so much time, right? Right now, I feel like I don't have enough time. That's why I'm always on the go. But if you could start early, like ha starting is half the battle, right? And so if you, could, if you have an idea, just go for it. Why not? You know, if, if, if you fail, so what? You learn so much from it, right? And if you do well, that's really even, even great. But don't be afraid to make mistakes. Don't be afraid to fail or don't be afraid to look bad you know or get embarrassed because in the end it's all going to help you at the end if you're able to get over that period and you know be hum you know humble yourself and uh and um yeah just keep your ego in check and then then these these ideas will really be easy to manifest um once you set it into motion so the uh yes yeah, so, 
I'm so excited about my uh, musical solos label because right now I'm in the middle of launching um, uh, David Schifrin's actually David Schifrin's next album. It's a full circle moment where now I'm I'm releasing David Schifrin's album. It's all Pulang album that uh, that I've been working on since since uh, you know a couple months ago when I started this music entrepreneur um, Zoom lecture series um, on you are the company and like listening to your inner voice and I have you know I also have like letting go of perfectionism all these series I, I started giving these little lectures into the uh, to clarinet studios and you know one thing led to another uh, my teacher said hey so why don't you release my next album then you know so I was my first time releasing um an album that i produced for somebody else so it's such an exciting time for me it's a brand new uh path forward i'm my own boss like so i the advice that i would give to the young young kids coming up is don't be afraid to be your own boss. That's amazing. Thank you so yes. much. This was so great. And it, all of your advice, we can see it through your story. And it's so, it was so cool. This was great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, there's so many gems in here, I think. And, you know, your advice just perfectly matches up with your, you know, how you've lived your life and your career. And yeah, there's, I can't wait for people to see this. <laughs>